This is a one transistor DRAM cell. It's obviously much smaller than an SRAM cell. It's also much smaller than a three transistor DRAM cell, at least when we first see it. Now, we have to understand how reading and writing works in a one transistor DRAM, uh, because especially when we consider reading, we will understand why this kind of memory is not easy to deal with. DRAMs are extremely dense, which is why they are favorable for creating main memories, but they are probably the most complicated memory uh, to read from and to maintain. They are probably even more complicated than uh, flash memories, even with the need to continuously monitor threshold voltages in, uh, in, flash, in flash ROMs. So let's consider how we read and write here. And the cell consists essentially of a single access transistor. So this transistor just works as an access transistor. The, the cell itself and storage takes place at this storage node on this storage capacitor CS. There's a single bit line, there's a single word line. It's pretty simple. So assume we want to store a zero, we drive a value of zero volt on the bit line, then enable the word line by raising the value high. This causes the access transistor to turn on and then discharges the storage capacitor and we store a zero volt on it. When the word line is disabled again, this zero volt is maintained on the storage capacitor CS in a high impedance state. Assuming we want to store a, a high value VDD, we drive VDD on the bit line and then we enable the word line. Because we are using an NMOS access transistor and the reason we use an NMOS is to promote density, this means that the maximum storage value at the storage capacitor is going to be VDD minus V threshold. Unless, of course, we drive the word line at VDD plus V threshold, in which case this is going to store a VDD. In all cases, when the word line is disabled again, this storage node is going to have a value of VDD stored in it in high impedance state. It's not actually writing that is interesting or uh, challenging. Uh, it's reading that we have to spend some time to understand. So reading in one transistor DRAMs uses a uh, dynamic read operation like all other memories, meaning that we pre-charge the bit line and then uh, enable the word line. So we are going to pre-charge the bit line capacitance. And let's first assume that we are pre-charging it to VDD. Now, we are going to enable the word line. If the storage capacitor is storing VDD, then we read a V output of VDD on the bit line. So this is the bit line, capacitor, the bit line voltage. If, on the other hand, the cell was storing a zero volt, then what is the V out that we would read? In that case, we have two capacitors at high impedance, the bit line capacitance storing a VDD, which it obtained from pre-charge, the storage capacitor CS containing zero volt, which it obtained from previously being uh, written to, and then these two are connected together using the ac access transistor. What's going to happen here is charge sharing. These two capacitors are now essentially in parallel with each other, so they're going to share their charges. Some of the VDD on the CBL is going to go to the storage capacitor. And we can calculate the value of V out by using the charge conservation uh, equation, which says uh, that VDD multiplied by CBL plus zero volt multiplied by CS is equal to V out multiplied by CBL plus V out multiplied by CS, which gives us a V out of VDD into CBL by CBL plus CS. Now, if we are pre-charging the bit line to VDD over 2 instead, then in the case where the storage capacitor has VDD, the bit line is going to charge share with the storage capacitor and the value of voltage on CBL is going to increase a little bit. 
if the cell is storing zero, then the value of voltage we read on CBL is going to decrease a little bit. This has the advantage that we observe a change in both cases when we are reading, which helps a little bit with the design of the sense amplifier, as we will see. Uh, in that case, then, uh, when we are reading a stored one, uh, what we're going to read is uh, VDD over 2 uh, plus VDD over 2 multiplied by the uh, charge sharing ratio CS over CBL plus CS. And when we are reading a stored 0, we are going to read a value of VDD over 2 minus the same delta V that we saw above. So VDD over 2 multiplied by CS over CBL plus CS. There's a couple of really, really, really important issues here. One of them is that one transistor DRAM cells have something called destructive read. This means that when you read the value stored in a certain cell, you also destroy the value stored in that cell because you are taking away or giving to the charge on the storage capacitor. At the end of the charge sharing operation, both CS and CBL have the same voltage value on them, which is neither zero volt nor VDD, which is the initial stored value on CS. So the read operation is going to destroy the stored value. So if you want to have any meaningful memory, then what you have to do is after you read a value, you have to go back and write it again to that cell, which really complicates reading from a DRAM cell. The other thing is that this, this specific delta V that we observe is really small. So you're going to pre-charge the bit line to VDD over 2. And the difference between reading a 1 and reading a 0 is basically that this, these two terms subtracted. The difference is VDD multiplied by CS over CBL plus CS. Now, CBL is the capacitance of the entire bit line. It's the capacitance of the metal line that runs along the entire length of the memory and it's also loaded by all the drains of all the access transistors whereas cs is a small capacitance in fact we cannot rely on the parasitic capacitance of the access transistor to provide cs because in that case this delta v is going to be imperceptible we have to use a physically created capacitor at this node to provide enough storage, to provide enough charge so that it has an impact on the bit line when we try to read from it. We have to make this capacitor as large as possible, but capacitance, for capacitance to increase, we have to increase its area. We have to increase the area of the, uh, the, the capacitor plates. And the whole idea of, of DRAM, one transistor DRAM cells is density. So we have an issue here, right? So let's take a look at, um, at the uh, layout of one transistor DRAM cells. And here we have a layout, uh, which is, has the advantage that it doesn't use specialized layers. So it uses normal CMOS layers. So this is the access transistor, right? And we are doing something a little bit weird here. We are using a diffusion bit line and a metal word line. Normally, the bit line would be a bit would be metal, and the word line would be polysilicon. But the problem here is that we are going to use polysilicon to create one plate of the storage capacitor, and this polysilicon is going to run the entire um, length of the array, and the other plate is actually a diffusion layer which is shorted to the uh, to the drain of the access transistor so this polysilicon plate is going to run the entire length of the array and it's going to be basically this ground so this is the poly and the other terminal is uh, the other plate is diffusion which is shorted to this terminal of the access transistor so we are not using any special layers here but the problem is this is a nonlinear capacitor. The capacitance, uh, because of the use of the diffusion layer, the capacitance here is nonlinear, uh, and um, it's really hard to manage. So we need to create a uh, linear capacitor, a normal uh, capacitor that behaves more or less the same way as a metal insulator metal capacitor. This capacitor is a MOS capacitor more or less, and that's not going to work. So to do this, we have to use a, another polysilicon layer. 
So in this case, we are using two polysilicon layers. There is something called poly1 and poly2. So you have to have two poly layers. Uh, pretty much the same way you have two poly layers when creating uh, flash memories, you have two poly layers here. So one of the poly layers is going to create the bottom plate of the capacitor, and the other is going to be the normal poly layer, which runs the length of the entire thing and forms ground. The bottom plate poly layer is going to be shorted to uh, the diffusion layer of, of the transistor drain by creating as many contacts as possible. Again, the storage capacitor needs to be as large as possible so that when it does charge sharing, it has as much of an impact on the bit line voltage as possible. Uh, the only way to do this is to increase plate area, which has a bad impact on cell area, and therefore density, which is the whole raison d'etre of one transistor DRAMs. Now, most practical DRAMs come in independent chips. The, they are not integrated in the same chip as the system that uses them, which allows them to do uh, some nifty tricks, like, for example, creating a capacitor um, through a 3D structure, where the plates of the capacitor are going to be, are going to look something like this, which uh, essentially increases the area between the plates, thus increasing their capacitance, without increasing the footprint that they do. Or perhaps uh, the capacitor is gonna be, is gonna look like this, and the access transistor is gonna be created uh, on the top of it. So you start to use 3D structures to increase density while increasing the value of storage capacitance. So we start to see that even though, um, you know, they might look really attractive at first, when you see DRAM cells, you might think, uh, well, this is the best memory you can make. It's, it looks really small, but we're starting to see uh, really strange things. The uh, layout needs to be weird so that we can have a large capacitor, so that we can have an impact while reading. Reading itself is very strange because it, it depends on charge sharing, and it's also destructive. You change the value of the, of the, of the stored va uh, voltage when you try to read it. Um, also, storage is purely dynamic, which leaves us open to uh, leakage or to any other signal integrity issue.